Pediatric Grand Rounds. It's a special pleasure today to have with us um, as our speaker, Dr. Ora Peskovitz, who holds a very special place in my heart, and you'll understand in a moment why that is. I admire Ora in so many ways. She's been a role model for me as a pediatrician, as an academic leader, and as a parent. And I've looked to Aura as an example throughout my career. It kind of feels like I've been looking up to Aura my entire life, which I guess I have since Aura is my big sister. Aura, I've always wanted to have an opportunity to introduce you, and I'm thrilled to finally get that chance to do that today. So welcome to UCSF and the Department of Pediatrics. I'm gonna turn it over to your colleague in endocrinology, Dr. Maya Lodish, who's our chief of the Division of Endocrinology, to do the formal introduction. Maya. Welcome. So I'm pleased to welcome our grand round speaker, Dr. Ora Peskowitz, a highly accomplished pediatric endocrinologist academic researcher and leader in medical education, who's currently the president of Oakland University in Rochester Hill, Michigan. Dr. Peskovitz graduated from the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. She completed residency in pediatrics at the University of Minnesota and went on to a fellowship in pediatric endocrinology at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. And this is where I first had the opportunity to meet Dr. Peskovitz during my own fellowship training there, where she gave an inspiring grand rounds and took the time to have lunch with the trainees. Her research is focused on the physiologic and molecular mechanisms responsible for disorders of growth and puberty and the development of novel therapies for these conditions. Dr. Peskovitz spent 21 years at Indiana University where she joined the Department of Pediatrics. She was the Executive Associate Dean for Research Affairs at the School of Medicine and the President and CEO of Riley Hospital for Children. She was then recruited to the University of Michigan in 2008 where she served as Executive Vice President for Medical Affairs and the Health System CEO. Dr. Peskovitz spent two years as Senior Vice President and US Medical Leader at Eli Lilly. She then returned to academia to become the president of Oakland University, where she's committed to the education and success of future students. Dr. Peskovitz has served as president of the Society of Pediatric Research, president of the Pediatric Endocrine Society, and was elected to the National Academy of Medicine in 2011. As you just heard, um, being a leader and a scholar seems to be a recurring theme in our family. And when I learned that Dr. Peskovitz's younger brother is our very own Dr. Raphael Hirsch, I wonder if there was a secret ingredient in the breakfast cereal that their parents gave them growing up. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Peskovitz. <laughs> Well, I want to thank um, both of you, um, Dr. Hirsch and um, uh, Dr. Lodish, for that extremely warm, uh, wonderful introduction. Um, what a thrill for me to be with you and with so many friends here today. Um, when Maya originally uh, welcomed me to uh, UCSF, I have to say that I was hoping that I would be with all of you in person. And I have to admit that I'm a little bit disappointed that we're having to do this by Zoom. Uh, but the topic that Maya asked me to talk about was leadership. And I have to say that at the time that I accepted this invitation, I didn't realize that we were going to be talking about pediatric leadership in such challenging times. But here we are. And um, I do want to disclose that I don't have uh, any uh, specific disclosures with respect to today's presentation. Uh, as I said, um, I want Maya to know uh, how absolutely delighted I am that she invited me uh, to give this presentation. 
as Maya indicated, we first met when she was a fellow at the NIH, and I've been following her career with tremendous admiration and respect, and I want the department and her division of pediatric endocrinology to know how thrilled I am that she was recruited to UCSF. She's without a doubt a rising star in pediatric endocrinology. She's been doing remarkable things since her fellowship days, and you are indeed uh, very fortunate to have her leading your extraordinary division of pediatric endocrinology. Uh, now, while I was also, like Maya, a fellow in pediatric endocrinology at the NIH, I have to tell you that it was always my personal dream to do my fellowship at UCSF. And the reason is because I wanted to be under the tutelage of the famous and world-renowned leaders at UCSF. And therefore, I want to dedicate my talk today to uh, Dr. Melvin Grumbach, the inaugural Edward B. Shaw Distinguished Professor of Pediatrics and Chair of this department between 1966 and 1986. Because at the time that I did my fellowship in pediatric endocrinology in the 1980s, it was this section of pediatric endocrinology, this division, under Dr. Grumbach and Drs. Selna Kaplan and Dr. Felix uh, Conti, that was the premier uh, division of pediatric endocrinology in the country. And that's why I wanted to train here. And throughout my own career, for decades, Dr. Grumbach served as a personal mentor and advisor and coach to me and um, I dearly admired and respected him, and he was a remarkable, remarkable man and leader, and I know to so many others here as well. I also have many other uh, wonderful friends and colleagues and mentors here. I don't know if any of you are in the audience today, um, but I want to acknowledge a number of you as well, including Sam Hawgood, um, Jeff Bluestone, uh, Elena Fuentes Affleck, uh, and many others, uh, including members of the Division of Pediatric Endocrinology, including my dear friends, Walter Miller, uh, Rob Lustig, um, Steve uh, Gittleman, and Steve Rosenthal. And I know that there are many, many others, and I apologize if I have neglected to mention a few of you. Now, um, uh, I wonder, because this is a pediatric talk, uh, if you recognize these children. Um, and uh, you might have a little hint of this. I was going to ask you if you knew which one was the oldest child, but Rafi's already told you that he was looking up to me, so you probably know that um, I'm the older of the two children here, uh, but the cuter one for sure um, is uh, Rafi, and um, I've had a tremendous respect and admiration for my younger brother. We're actually two of four children. Um, we have uh, two younger brothers as well. And if you didn't recognize Rafi there, perhaps you'd recognize him here. Now, I wasn't always pushing him around uh, because as you uh, probably know, he's gone on to a most illustrious career and I uh, remain extraordinarily proud of his uh, remarkable accomplishments. And um, I uh, am absolutely thrilled that he is now chair of um, this extraordinary department. So when Maya uh, invited me to come and give a talk on leadership, she asked me to share with you what I've learned about leadership, mentorship, and life. And so I thought that perhaps I would share with you a little bit about what I've learned, but I'm not gonna go all the way back to my conception. And in fact, what I'm going to start with is what I learned uh, in ninth grade. And Maya, you asked me where I went to school in ninth grade. And in fact, it was at Pyle Junior High, the school that we just talked about. Now that was a very unusual school. It was a public school, but it was a school that offered a really unique class. And it was a class that was called Research and Development. And when I took that class, I was the only girl 
in this class. It was a very unusual class that offered the opportunity to do a research study. And this research study was an independent study class. Now, in, if you think back to your ninth grade, you probably remember that you might not have been interested in research and you might not have known what development was. And that was certainly the case for me. I was probably interested in the class because I was interested in the fact that all the other people in the class were boys. And that's what probably eventually led me to a career in pediatric endocrinology. But the requirement of the class was that you think about a scientific question, that you develop a hypothesis around that question, and then that you develop a series of experiments to test the hypothesis, and then that you execute those scientific questions. Well, back when I was in ninth grade, my interests were in music. And in fact, I played the piano. And my thoughts were that maybe if you played music to plants, you could make them grow. And so I developed an hypothesis that if you made plants grow better, they would respond. And so I put together the following experiment. I took three groups of plants and one group of plants was my control group and I played no music to them. Because I was interested in classical music, the second group of plants I played classical music to, in this case, Beethoven. And because it was the late 1960s, the third group of plants I played uh, roll over Beethoven, the Beatles too, and I saw, tried to see whether or not they would respond better. Well, I wonder if you know which group of plants grew the best? Well, as it happens, none of the plants grew. I wasn't very good at growing plants, but this is what I learned. I learned that it was absolutely fascinating that you could develop a hypothesis, ask a scientific question, set up an experiment to test the hypothesis, and then see whether or not it worked. And what I learned from that was that I just loved science. And as a result, I, because I lived in the backyard of the NIH, I then, for the rest of ninth grade, 10th grade and 11th grade, I graduated high school after 11th grade, every day after school, went to the NIH and worked with a mentor and learned that I could do research. But I also learned that I wasn't so interested in plant science. And I asked my mentor whether it was possible to do scientific experiments about asking questions of human science. And he said to me, you know, Aura, you could become a physician scientist. And so that led eventually to me deciding that I could go to medical school and become a physician scientist. And I enrolled at Northwestern, which was at the time had a six year medical program. And here I am graduating at the age of 23 with a MD. And I went on, as Maya told you, to get my fellowship at the NIH and pursued a career in research. I also, during that time in medical school, met my husband who was one year ahead of me in that six year medical program. And he also was interested in a career as a physician scientist. And so together we decided to pursue careers as physician scientists. I as a pediatric endocrinologist and Mark as a, uh, in a career as a transplant surgeon. And so one of the things I wanna talk about is the complexity of dual career marriages and how one navigates the complexity of that. And here you can see how challenging that is because here is Mark in one of our major collaborations, the collaboration of trying to have three young children on top of a transplant career. You can see Mark with our three children. We had three children in three and a half years. Aliza, who today is a 36 year old lawyer with three children of her own, 
Ari, who's a 35-year-old architect with two children of his own, and Naomi, who is a 33-year-old um, broadcast journalist working at CBS News in Manhattan, pregnant with her first child. So um, very, very complex uh, marriage with um, the wonderful opportunity to have children of our own, but the complexity of navigating dual careers. So how does one develop a successful dual career marriage and pursue leadership? So over the years, I developed what I would consider the component elements of a successful leadership principle. And these are the five elements that I think are most important. The first is that you must seek aspirational goals, and then a plan to pursue those goals. The second is you need to be flexible and adaptable because at some point, those great plans that you have are probably going to go awry. The third is to look for balance. The fourth is to seek great mentors. And the fifth is to focus on the importance of happiness. And I now want to go through the importance of each of these five components of successful leadership. Let's take a moment and look at goals and how important they are. Well, back then when I was in medical school, my goals were to have six children. Because I was going to have six children and I was interested in playing the piano, my thought was that I would continue to play the piano. I was going to do that semi-professionally, thinking that I couldn't probably do it fully professionally. And because I was going to play the piano and have six children, I thought I'd probably practice medicine only part-time. Well, what about the reality? Did I achieve any of those goals? No. First, I only had three children because you know what? My husband pooped out. Well, actually, it really wasn't that he pooped out. I pooped out because after three children in three and a half years, I think we both realized it wasn't really possible to keep going with the children because actually I never had time to play the piano at all. And what's part time? It never happened. Maya gave you a little bit about my background and the career that I ended up pursuing, and I never really worked part-time. I ended up working full-time, so I never played the piano. And I only had three children as much as I loved children. And so I never achieved successfully any of these goals, but that didn't mean that I didn't have goals. So then I sought other goals. So my next goal was that my children would be successful, productive, and happy. And now I have five grandchildren and a sixth on the way. But of course, the goal that they be successful and happy is really not my goal. It's out of my control completely. But now that I'm president of Oakland University, our vision is to unlock potential and leave a lasting impact on the world through the transformative power of education and research. And I want to provide leadership that inspires a positive change in the world. And we have institutional goals, and that includes having our students be successful through the power of research and scholarly activity, through outstanding community engagement, and through important diversity, equity, and inclusion. But in spite of the fact that we have an aggressive strategic plan and tactics to achieve these goals, what happened in 2020? Well, there was a historic confluence of conflicts that has significantly impeded the aggressive strategic plan that we have around these goals. And my job as president is to maintain a campus this year that is healthy, safe, that is financially stable, diverse, welcoming, and that's a haven for free expression and dialogue on top of also trying to achieve those goals. So that really does challenge my leadership on top of everything else that we're trying to achieve. So when you are trying to think about what your goals need to be, what should you be doing? How do you set your goals? 
Well, I suggest that what you do is that you too seek aspirational goals and you should always aim high because Robert Browning said that a man's reach, and I would like to paraphrase and say, a person's reach should always exceed his or her grasp for what is heaven for. You should set goals that are very high. You should reach for the stars. And even if you don't achieve those high aspirational goals, what is the worst thing that could happen? You might miss, and that might happen. And then you might not achieve those high, high aspirational goals that you set. But if that happens, and you miss those super high goals, you might land on the moon. And if that happens, you get a moon landing. And then what's the worst thing that happens if you miss that super high goal and you land on the moon? You have a couple choices. You can either tell people the truth that you missed, or you could tell people that you were always aiming for a moon landing. Because what do people think if you tell them that you had a moon landing. They think that's a pretty darn good achievement. And I can just tell you from my own experience that I actually pretty much never achieved the actual goal that I originally set for myself. I aimed for sick children, I got three. When I went to the University of Michigan to become the CEO of the health system, that wasn't actually ever my first choice. When I told you I wanted to come to the University of California in San Francisco for my fellowship, that wasn't my, that was my first choice. I ended up at the NIH. And everything that I ever accomplished in my life was pretty much always a moon landing. But if you only aim to cross the street, then that's probably the most you're ever going to do. So I encourage you tonight when you're thinking about what the next step is in your life, to set high aspirational goals. If you miss, you'll probably get a moon landing and there's really nothing wrong with that. And that's what I encourage you to do. Because who's this guy? That's Charles Darwin. And he encouraged you to be flexible and adaptable because he said, it's not the strongest or the most intelligent who will survive but rather those who best manage change. And I know that I, for one, have never been the strongest and I've certainly never been the most intelligent, but I have been generally pretty resilient and pretty adaptable. And that's what I encourage you to be too. I wanna to turn my attention now for a minute to the importance of balance in your life. The idea that you don't just focus on work or on your home life, but that you try to always find some form of balance in your life, that you find the way to identify pleasure and opportunity to enjoy parts of your life beyond the work. One of my children, my youngest daughter, who's a television anchor and reporter, every year on Mother's Day would always wish me a happy Mother's Day on air, and always say, and my mom, she doesn't believe in work-life balance. But that's not really true that I don't believe in work-life balance. I always say that there's no such thing as work-life balance, but that's because we're only given one life, and we need to learn to balance that. And what I mean by that is that most of you are pediatricians, as am I. And if you get a sick patient at work, we worry about those patients. You can't ever really forget about your sick patient at work. So when you go home at the end of the day, you're still worrying about that patient. And you take that worry with you when you come home. At the same time, if you have someone you're worrying about at home, whether it's your own child or your parent or another problem, a spouse or something that worries you at home, it's not really possible to separate that when you come back to work. And so our work lives and our home lives 
do merge into one, no matter how hard we try to separate those two. And so we're given one life and we do need to figure out how to balance those. And that's why it's important to find time to get balance in our lives as well. Now I wanna turn my time for a moment to the importance of mentoring. Steven Spielberg said, the delicate balance of mentoring someone is not in creating them in your own image, but giving them the opportunity to create themselves. And for this, I'm actually very indebted again to Dr. Grumbach, who served as an important mentor to me from a distance. When I was a fellow at the NIH, I was desperate to find mentors who could help me because there was no mentor in the early 1980s who looked like me. I looked desperately at the NIH, but at the time, there were very few women mentors who I aspired to be like. And so I developed this concept that I use today that I call the mentor quilt. And this is a concept that I still consider very, very important in my life. And because there was no one who looked just like me, I created this idea of a quilt of mentors where every quilt, every patch on my quilt is a different person. So because there was no clone of me, I added different patches and each patch on my quilt was someone who served a different purpose for me. So Dr. Grumbach was one patch on my quilt. That was someone who was a professional mentor for me. Someone else was a scientific mentor who helped mentor me on my scientific projects. Someone else served as a personal mentor to me. That was another patch on my quilt. When I started to have children, Someone else served as a patch on my quilt to help me become a better mother. Someone else helped me with childcare. Someone else taught me about finances. Later, when I became the CEO of a health system, someone taught me how to be a better finance person. I never knew how to be the CEO of a hospital or a health system. When I encountered some ethical challenges in the workplace, Someone taught me about bioethics, and that person became a bioethics per person, and another patch got added to my quilt. When I wanted to provide service in the community, I looked to mentors to teach me how to do that, and I added another patch on my quilt. And after I was married for 31 years, my beloved husband, Mark, was killed in a car accident commuting between Ann Arbor and Indianapolis. And all of a sudden, I desperately needed widow mentors. And then again, I added widow mentors to my mentor quilt. And then three years ago, when I became president at Oakland University, I needed people to mentor me on how to be a university president. I never discarded any of the patches on my quilt but I kept adding new patches on my mentor quilt. And today I have the most amazing, warm, luxurious and comforting mentor quilt. And I just pull out that quilt and wrap myself in it. And it is the most comforting, luxurious, wonderful mentor quilt and I use it on a regular basis. And I call on these mentors whenever I need them. So you may have a mentor quilt already, no matter whether you're a student or a fellow or a resident or a faculty member. And if you don't, I encourage you to get a mentor quilt now because it's something that I think you will find to be extraordinarily beneficial and useful to you. I wanna turn my attention now to the topic of happiness. Because if you take a moment and think about people that you know in your life who are successful, 
whether they're leaders or in the community, professionally or personally, I would tell you that the really successful ones are happy people. And so it is very important that you seek happiness in your life because I believe that success is correlated with happiness. But happiness is not the same as satisfaction. What do I mean by that? Well, satisfaction is associated with contentedness and contentedness is associated with complacency and complacency leads to mediocrity. And I've already told you that you should not be mediocre and therefore you don't wanna be satisfied. You need to aspire to reach the highest level possible. So be happy, but don't accept complacency or mediocrity or just be satisfied. Aspire to greatness. So what is it that will lead you to a fulfilling and fruitful career? And I think there are formulas that you can follow that will lead to a fruitful and fulfilling career. And without a doubt, it is not going to be about money. So what is it about? Well, there are four things that I think are important for a fruitful and fulfilling career. And the first three are really derived from Daniel, Pink, Daniel Pink's book, Drive. The first and probably most important thing of all is to feel in your job a sense of purpose. So all of us who are pediatricians, I think, really are fortunate because we start out ahead of almost everybody else here. You know, if you work in a children's hospital, we automatically have this sense of purpose. And I think this is one of the things that drove us to pediatrics. I have to admit that I feel this also in my current job at the kind of university where I work today, but it really makes a difference. The second thing is mastery over your job. Now, if you're a medical student and even a resident, you might not yet have that complete sense of mastery, but that's why you're in school or in training. You're gaining that mastery. The third is autonomy, that you don't have someone breathing down your neck once you've obtained that mastery. And the fourth is feeling respected by your supervisor. This is your immediate supervisor. This isn't Rafi, if, unless he is your immediate supervisor, or Sam Hoggood. This is the person who immediately supervises you. And so the sense that your supervisor respects and admires you and gives you autonomy is the feeling that you have on a day-to-day -day basis that you need to feel that you have a fruitful and fulfilling career. But what happens if you get to a point in your life where you don't have this sense of happiness and you sense that you don't have a fruitful and fulfilling career? And by the way, I think almost everyone at some point in their career or their personal life gets to the point where they feel that they're not happy and they can't resolve issues then what should you do? Well, I already told you, you will not be successful if you're not happy. And then I believe you need to begin to tackle Aura's rules of the four Ps. And this is what I believe you should do. The first is you need to identify what is the problem that is causing you the unhappiness. And then if you figure it out, then you need to press and push and lobby to change the thing that's making you unhappy. I'll give you an example. Many years ago, when I was the director of pediatric endocrinology at Indiana University and Riley Hospital, one of the pediatric endocrinologists on my team who worked for me said that she couldn't work successfully and productively because she was in an office that didn't have a window. And if she could only get an office with a window, she was convinced she would be more productive. So. We looked for an office with a window. It happened to be smaller than her other office, but she preferred that. 
we did we made the trade she got an office with a window and today she is a highly productive endocrinologist you endocrinologists who might be here know who she is and it made a difference so that worked for her and she didn't need to go to the second p that's here she changed we together changed the external environment and it made all the difference but if that doesn't work for you then you need to go to the second p and that means instead of changing the external environment you need to change yourself and that means you need to put up with it this happened to me many years ago mark and i my husband and i needed to find jobs in the same city we had looked all over the country we had made several moves together and we couldn't find two careers in academic institutions in the same place so we looked and we looked and we looked and finally he found a great job for him in indiana i said where is india no place in the middle of some place i never heard of there's no way i could go there and so i pressed and i pushed and i lobbied but at the end of the day it didn't work so finally, I said, I can't change the external circumstance. I'm going to have to put up with it and change my attitude and myself. And we moved to Indianapolis. And you know what? For the next 21 years, I accepted it. I lived with it. Our children spent the next 21 years there. They grew up there. And it turned out to be absolutely fantastic. And as you heard, I had a great career there. And it was wonderful. So I changed me and it was fantastic. But you know what? Sometimes that doesn't work either. And when that happens, what should you do? This sometimes happens in families. It sometimes happens in relationships. You have to go to counseling sometimes when that happens, if it's in your marriage. So you cannot be unhappy. So what do you do if that happens? Well, then if you try to change the environment, if you try to change yourself, you then have to go to the third P and you have to pull out because you will not be successful if you're not happy. And so if it doesn't work, you need to leave because at the end of the day, you must play. It's critical that you be happy to be successful. I now want to turn to what I have concluded over many years is a series of qualities and characteristics that I believe define extraordinary leaders. And these are unique qualities and characteristics that I think distinguish extraordinary leaders from just ordinary leaders. And I call these qualities the eight C's. Now the first one actually doesn't start with a C, it starts with an M, but it includes a C, and it's called moral compass. If you're a religious person, this is your sense of religion. If you're not a religious person, it's your North Star, it's your conscience, it's what you believe sets you going in the morning, it's your sense of right and wrong. The second C is compassion. For those of us in pediatrics, I think it really drives many of us it lets us know that there's always someone in the world who has it harder than you. And um, I think most of us feel a great sense of this if we work in a pediatric children's hospital. The third C is courage. And it's the sense that you will do the right thing, no matter even if someone is watching or not. The fourth C is contribution. It's the idea that you want to make a difference in the world. You know, Anne Frank um, said, isn't, isn't it wonderful that no one need wait but a single moment before starting to make the world a better place? But you know, she obviously died when she was 16 years old and she didn't get to do that, but her diary did. And so wanting to make a contribution is very important to extraordinary leadership. The next C is commitment. You can use all these words and it's important, but if you don't have the brute force and um, the due diligence that it takes, you're not going to be an extraordinary leader. 
The next C is communication. It's essential to be able to articulate your vision, your goals, and what you intend to do. And the seventh C is collaboration. No successful leader ever functioned alone. It does take a village. It does take a team to be successful. And then finally, the eighth C, the one that I call the spicy sauce, the one that really is unique is creativity. Because creative people do see the same thing that everyone else sees, but they do see it in a different way. And creative leaders solve problems in unique ways. So while all of these C's are important and you don't have to be born with any of them, creative people are really special, but it's all of these C's together that make for extraordinary leadership. I want to say a special thing about creativity, though, because creativity takes many forms and it's not restricted to those in artistic fields. And for leadership in our fields, in medicine, in science, in healthcare, in education, it's particularly important. And I am especially proud of my brother Rafi, who I do think has elements of creative leadership. And I don't know if you're aware that in addition to being a physician scientist, he's also an artist. And I will just mention two um, science fiction books that he's written that you may not be aware of, um, but uh, these two novels that he's written are quite interesting. And one of them, The Transformed, actually predicted a pandemic. Uh, it's actually a cancer pandemic, um, but not too dissimilar from what we are facing right now in uh, this era of uh, the COVID-19 uh, global pandemic. Well, this is indeed a historic time um, for needing great leadership because the major crises that we are facing in 2020 has been a confluence of crises. It's unbelievable how in less than one year we have faced this incredible confluence of major crises, starting with obviously the health crisis of this COVID-19 global pandemic, which then resulted in the economic global downturn that has faced the entire world. And the environmental crisis of climate change, and here what you're facing even today in San Francisco and all of California with the fires that you're facing, but it's not just in California, but obviously the rest of the country and around the world is also facing these environmental climate change crises. And in addition, the racial injustice and social unrest precipitated at least in part by the George Floyd murder, but actually that George Floyd murder uncovered what we already knew was racial injustice and social unrest. And then the educational K through 12 higher education crisis also precipitated by the rest of this. So never before was there a greater need for leadership than what we're seeing today in 2020. I want to focus for a moment at the end of my talk here on the issues facing higher education because that is what I am personally facing as the president of a university. And I thought I would just end with a few examples from higher education. So as you're aware, in spring of 2020, we were all across the country, universities were faced with sending our students home and with closing universities. And Oakland University, where I'm president, was no different. But at the same time, we were faced with the dilemma of what we would be doing in the fall of 2020. And the issues that we faced included, and I'm just going to highlight a few of them, the following issues. Would we go to remote learning versus face-to-face -face instruction? What about our residential students versus having everybody be commuters? And some universities were largely residential. Some, like ours, were greater commuter uh, students. What about domestic students versus international students? Excuse me. What about laboratory studies versus, like medical schools, clinical studies versus classroom studies? 
And a big question that came up was, should students take a gap year or not? Well, I got uh, pulled in to a major national question about this when in May of this past year, the California state system was the largest system in the country. 500,000 students right here in California announced they were the first major system to announce that they would go online only. That was announced on May 12th of 2020. And at that time, I got contacted by CNN, by John King, to go on CNN to counter the California state announcement. And the reason I got called was because in Michigan, there are 15 public universities and Oakland University is one of the public universities. And we were the first public university in Michigan to announce that we were going to not go online, but we would go to a hybrid model. And in fact, we also announced, I wrote an op-ed in the Detroit Free Press that received a lot of national recognition that I spoke out loudly that students should not take a gap year in 2020, but instead should go to college. And I, in that op-ed, I talked about how important it was not only for students to not take a gap year, but that they should go to college and focus on student-focused service. And one of the reasons is the profile of Oakland University, and I thought you should know a little bit about us. So we're a university that has 19,000 students. 32% of our students are first-generation students. 35% are Pell Grant recipients. And we're only 20% residential students, meaning that 80% are actually commuter students. And we're located in Rochester, Michigan, which is a suburb of Detroit. And we're not a college town. Um, we're part of the local community. And so we have a different profile from, uh, for example, the University of Michigan, where I was previously. So our response to the COVID crisis for our fall reopening, when we opened um, on September 3rd, is what we call the Grizzlies Protect Grizzlies uh, plan. You can see um, our icon here. And it has five points. It's to slow the spread of COVID-19, to avoid outbreaks, to ensure compliance, to adapt instruction, and to preserve campus life. And in order to ensure that we slow the spread, we require that all faculty, staff, and students sign a daily honor pledge electronically, that they also sign a daily health assessment, and we mandate face coverings, social distancing, and we have rigorous hygiene protocols. What you see on this slide is um, a person who has passed the daily health assessment, when they pass, they get a green bar. If they don't pass, they get a red bar and they're not allowed to come to school or to go as an employee on anywhere on campus. To avoid outbreaks, uh, we uh, have resident student testing, which is a partnership between our county health department, the university and our health system. And we maintain a uh, campus metric dashboard. We also have, um, technological support, and we use a biosensor, which is strongly encouraged for students, faculty, staff, um, and uh, students, and it continuously measures temperature, respiratory rate, and heart rate, and we have contact tracing through this uh, Bluetooth technology. We're also monitoring um, sewage um, from the residence halls as part of a novel uh, technique, which is still um, pretty um, preliminary. And to ensure compliance, we have a comprehensive campus-wide awareness campaign, and we prefer carrots to sticks. So there is a progressive education uh, program largely led by our students, but uh, it also involves disciplinary enforcement if the students are not compliant. But to tell you the truth, so far we've had outstanding compliance at Oakland. Our instruction is 26% in person, 63% online, and 11% hybrid. And to preserve campus life, we're really focused on this. In the spring, we had to cancel commencement, but our students were desperate to have commencement. And so in August, 
we had drive-in commencement ceremonies. And you can see what it looked like here. It was highly successful and um, they loved it. Um, it was a very creative and novel approach to commencement and it worked really very well. And we are progressing with Welcome Week, Career Fair, International Night, Hispanic Month, and Homecoming, and all in a hybrid model. Um, with respect to racial injustice and raising social consciousness, uh, my senior vice president and chief diversity officer and I have had major uh, publications. We've hosted a racial nonviolence demonstration and created a George Floyd academic scholarship and the entire university has signed a diversity pledge. And we have campus-wide unconscious bias training, which has been extremely effective. And I wanna end by just also mentioning budget management because we, like many other universities, have also struggled with financial um, problems since the COVID crisis. But our values have led us to prioritize our people first. We uh, insisted on having no job cuts or layoffs, and I uh, insisted that we would have no tuition increase for this fall semester. But of course, that meant we had to do something else. And so we froze university-sponsored travel. We had no new construction projects and no new hires. And so we had progressive salary cuts ranging from 2 to 20%. As president, I took 20%. Um, but um, others took lower cuts. And those who were below $100,000 in salary were all held harmless. So in closing, leadership in challenging times requires that outstanding leaders develop aspirational goals and plans to achieve those goals, but they must remain flexible and adaptable. They should seek balance, find great mentors, and also attain happiness. And they should pursue the eight C's. And I want to end with an example of these eight C's as demonstrated by Oakland University students who were at home during the peak of the COVID crisis, but who utilized all of these C's to develop the following. They composed they uh, performed and wrote uh, the following number, and I hope you'll uh, enjoy uh, this. <laughs> Okay. Well, that's all I have. Thank you. I'm happy to uh, entertain any comments or questions. Thank you so much for that beautiful and inspiring talk. 
Thanks, Maya. Thank you so much, Dr. Peskovic. Um, uh, we have um, a few comments on the, uh, well, a lot of people saying hello. Uh, ah. Yes. Uh, uh, Dr. Jan Marzel, Dr. Elena fuentes Atlik, Dr. Anita Markov, and then a, a comment also on the Q&A from Dr. Rob Lustig, who suggests adding a ninth C, connection, yeah. eye to eye. He says, if you don't establish connection, you can't be a leader. Eye to eye connection activates mirror neurons in the occipital cortex, which increases serotonin neurotransmission and increases emotional well being. You could also add a tenth C, cope. So that's from Dr. Lustig. I agree with Dr. Lustig. I would never disagree with him. You're smart, neither would I. <laughs> um, I don't see any other questions or comments on the chat. Okay. Um, so I think we're gonna just say that you've left everybody inspired with your comments. Um, Dr. Lodis, Dr. Hirsch, anything to add? I have a, a, uh, go ahead, Maya. I have a question. Do you think that out of this crazy, almost ap apocalyptic time that there may be lessons learned that will benefit us in the long term. I mean, with my own family, we've we've had some moments of of truth, I think, that it's putting things in perspective. But do you do you see any any good that can come out of all this? Yeah. Well I mean I do think there are a lot of things that we will definitely as a society and um, as health systems and academics start to do differently. There's no question about that. Um, I know, for example, that even meetings like this, you know, I, I suspect we will do less traveling, for example. I think that a lot of us will recognize that we can accomplish a lot of our work more efficiently and effectively in different ways. And I already think that uh, businesses and companies and academics uh, ha will have found uh, more uh, e efficient ways to do effective work. So I definitely think that. Now that's a little less true in healthcare delivery, but even still, I, I think telehealth, I, I had during the peak of the um, uh, pandemic pandemic in the spring, I had a telehealth visit, which was very efficient. Um, so I think we will start to see changes like that happen. And um, I think that they will be more cost effective as well. So there's no question in my mind, I think um, offices will uh, change the way they work too. So we will see productive things happen. Um, I like Dr. Lustig's point about connection, though, because I think we are missing some human connections. I'm actually lonely for my children and grandchildren, so some of the connections are actually, um, we're missing some of that. Those of us that, you know, miss the hugging and the kissing and the touching, I think some of that is, we're being deprived of some of that. But there are some positive things, uh, and there definitely are many negative things. Well, Aura, uh, I would like to thank you for an outstanding, uh, very thought-provoking address. Once again, I have reason to look up to my big sister. Uh, I'll just end by saying it's always risky to show baby pictures, but I think you pulled this one off okay. Uh, <laughs> well, you are a beautiful baby. <laughs> thanks to everybody for participating in Grand Rounds today. Be well, and we'll see you all next week. Have a good day. Thanks.